we seem to have lost um, this concept that God might intervene and there may be able to be verifiable um, uh, information to be able to tell it happened. Is God an interventionist God? Does he step into this world, hear prayers, and, and um, act in the way, in other cases, like he did with this priest? And then I began to study more about whether God does intervene, like the story of Fatima. Um, as a lawyer, looking back, you know, I couldn't believe that this claim of 70,000 people witnessed some the most colossal events since the time of Christ's resurrection occurring in our times. And no one's talking about it. And why? Is there something about the witnesses' testimony that was failing? Why doesn't the church talk about it? And that concerned me that we seem to have lost um, this concept that God might intervene and there may be able to be verifiable um, uh, information to be able to tell it happened. So I then began to study um, cases that have claimed um, mystical phenomena in our world today. And with science advances the way it has, we were able to look at things in a more detailed way than they would have been done before. And so when there were claims of people having apparitions, I wanted to know what happens in their brain. Why are they seeing things that we don't see? Why are they hearing things that we don't hear? Is the brain acting in, in, a, in, a, in an abnormal sort of way to reflect this behaviour? So then I went on from there to other things. I uh, heard about the statue of Christ crying and believing, bleeding in Bolivia. And, you know, no one ever takes these things seriously. They think that perhaps, you know, this is all just a hoax. And that's the mainstream media's view. But the question was, have we used the, the best of science to be able to examine what the claim is? Is it blood? Is, is it, does it have genetic material? I mean, that story of the statue, which you know about from my book and from my documentaries, um, is an incredible story. And it's part of a mosaic of things that have happened in recent times that all have a meaning. But the most important story, I think, that we did, well, there's two very important stories, which will come to later, namely the Eucharistic miracle of Buenos Aires, which I was privileged to have been able to do the investigation on for now 20 years. But when it came to this story of um, mystics and whether uh, God is intervening in our world, I was introduced to a person in Bolivia called Cate Rivas. She claimed to have been receiving messages from Jesus and, and she claimed to have had the stigmata. Um, I interviewed her. <clears throat> I was impressed by her. I, I interviewed her spiritual director. And I got some footage of um, when she had the, the stigmata on a previous occasion. I looked at that. I interviewed the witnesses who were there. And I thought, this, this sounds like a plausible story. I, you know, back in Australia, I am um, the, the lawyer for, uh, was the lawyer for, now he's passed away, the Australia's most notable friends, uh, the most notable investigative journalist, who's like, was a household name in this country for many years. What he said, people believed him. He was, he was regarded as being the man you got when you've got a difficult story and you want to find the truth. Now, I approached him with this story of what was happening in, in Bolivia with this person. And his reaction was, look, he wasn't even prepared to look at the footage. He says, look, these things don't happen. You know, he says, I've done stories like this. There's always another explanation. Um, you know, the, these things just don't happen. I said, Mike, you, um, and that his person was named Mike, Mike Willisey. Everyone in Australia knows him. He said to me, uh, um, you know, these things don't happen. And I said to him, you know, you've got a reputation for being able to present a story based upon your examination and you present the truth. Here, you don't even want to look at the evidence and you proffer an explanation. How many other stories in your uh, journalistic career have you treated that way? And I said, why don't you at least look at the facts and then tell me what you think? And I said, better still, prove me wrong. Well, that struck a spark in him. He decided, I've got to check this thing out. So he came with me to Bolivia and I introduced him to this person. Uh, while we were there, um, you know, Jesus relates, speaks to her and, um, and this is a, a, something that's hard to believe. And um, I, I might just interpose this thing, you know. You know, we look at the history of the saints you know, in, in our, our Catholic history and we see people like St. Catherine of Siena, Padre Pio, St. Francis, and... Um, They've had extraordinary experiences, and we often think to ourselves, wouldn't it have been great to have been there in those times to see these people, to witness what they experience, 
to see what happens when Jesus or God the Father is right at dictating to St. Catherine of Siena, volumes of profound theology, which ended up being something that cured the church of its time. But I've been able to do this with this modern day mystic, film it as she's been receiving dictation with, with messages to humanity of the same, the same caliber as St. Catherine of Siena. But at this stage, I've in, I introduced Mike Willisy to her, and um, she says to, through her to this journalist, Mike, I've given you many talents, um, and I want you to use them for me. Um, I want a program made, and he explained more about that program. And he says, Katya will have the stigmata, not today. It will happen in two months' time on the day after the Feast of Corpus Christi. Now, can you imagine this? We're actually filming someone predicting they're going to have the stigmata. Hello, dear LifeSite family. The very first Christmas was a dark time. With the world in the clutches of a foreign and hostile power, and with religious leaders betraying God and their flocks at every opportunity. But yet, it was in that very time that the angels joyfully announced to the shepherds the birth of the long-awaited Messiah, the Holy One of Israel, Jesus the Christ. And we are in very similar times again. Millions of people worldwide are searching for truth and light as our fragile world seems to be growing darker by the day. Our work at LifeSite News results from an unwavering trust in our holy call to evangelize, to bring the world the truth, ultimately the fullness of the truth himself. At LifeSite, we pledge ourselves anew to boldly ring out the truth of Christ on life, faith, family, and freedom. We're in the midst of our second annual Gifts of Gratitude Christmas campaign and invite you to join us in celebrating LifeSite News' special way of sharing reflections and reactions directly from the heart about what truly motivates us here to work for you on the front lines of the culture war. So during our Christmas campaign, we must raise $750,000 in order to meet the minimum amount required to keep our news mission and operations going. So we rely on your gracious help and support to keep our truthful news mission going, especially as we close 2023 and embrace the lean and early winter months. This is our largest goal of the entire year and one that requires each of you to prayerfully consider a donation. Please know that any amount helps. To give your own personal gift of gratitude, you can donate by clicking on the big red banner at the main homepage of LifeSite News or the giving link that can be found below in the video description box. It is only through your love, prayers, and generous support for our mission that we are able to continue reporting the truth without compromise. This Christmas season, let each of us do what we can to be the light that we are called to be in this culture of darkness and so we can enable the truth himself to shine ever so brightly as a result. So I want to thank you so much for your unwavering support and continued prayers for LifeSite News. And I pray you have a happy and holy Christmas. May God bless you. They also say what an army of intercessors that would be uh, for us, both to, to end the culture of death, but also to help us uh, in, in our current struggles that we have in the world today. So this um, prayer of Bishop Fulton J. Sheen. First of all, give us the prayer if you could, Matt, and then tell us a little bit about it. So it goes something. Um, so uh, this is from the Archdiocese of New York's website, the Respect Life Office. Uh, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I love you very much. I beg you spare the life of, and you can either pick a name or just say the unborn baby that I've spiritually adopted who is in danger of abortion. There's a couple different ways you could do this prayer. I mean, you could do it over nine months. So every month representing nine months of pregnancy. So if you start it now, you know, we get to Christmas, it'll be the ninth month, or you could do it as a novena. Um, and this prayer is, is basically you're spiritually adopting a baby that is in danger of abortion. Uh, should we be so blessed to, uh, you know, achieve eternal salvation? We maybe we, we, we would get to know, of course, what our works benefited and perhaps get to meet those uh, babies we spiritually adopted. And so this is um, uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen, one of the great uh, relatively recent 
um, Catholic uh, leaders. And actually, when I was in grade school, I used to do this. My religion teacher was a distant relative of uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen. And the church I go to now, they have binders full of all of the spiritually adopted babies that their parish has done um, going back years in a little little shrine with with Mary. And, and so it's just quite beautiful, this, this dedication uh, to saving babies from abortion, because even if the Supreme Court, even though the Supreme Court made a great decision in June, there's still plenty of work to do here and, of course, across the world to, to end the, the violence of abortion. Indeed so. Now, people might wonder, is there official teaching? Because this comes up to a rather controversial thing in the church. What happens to babies when aborted? And it's sort of a question left unanswered. What's your understanding of the church's teaching on that? It's a gray area. Um, my understanding is that the idea of limbo has not necessarily been abolished. We can, uh, so so it's, it's it's up in the air. Some would say, well, is it a form of baptism of desire in the same way of if there was a Protestant who was converting and was, let's say, killed the day before Easter vigil? Well, he had the desire to become a baptized, or he had the desire to enter the Catholic Church. Um, it's one of those things we don't really, won't really know, I guess, until the end of the end of time. Um, we can feel confident that a baby who died, of course, no baby could really die through their own fault, um, would not uh, suffer. And I think we can trust in God that he would take care of the littlest of ones um, in, in whatever in whatever form that is. Now, just so that people understand, limbo uh, is a place of total happiness, but it's not the full union, the beatific vision with God uh, that is experienced by the saints and angels in heaven. So there is a very much qualitative difference there. There is an argument, and it's been made quite forcefully. It was in discussion in Rome already over a decade ago, but it was the comparison of the babies who died uh, in Christ's stead, you might say, um, when he had to, the Holy Family had to flee to Egypt. Uh, the decree went out from Herod to kill all the little babies, uh, two years old and under, male babies. And uh, that got executed. And so hundreds or maybe more of these little babies were killed. We regard them as saints. On December 28th, we celebrate the Feast of the Holy Innocents and regard all those children as saints. So the argument has been made that, you know, all these unborn children are in a very similar way um, saints. And the move was, the request was of this group that's pushing forward this cause to have them declared such. Um, and one of the, you know, this is, of course, what they, the main argument is the comparison to these, uh, to the holy innocents. And um, they also say what an army of intercessors that would be uh, for us, both to, to end the culture of death, but also to help us uh, in, in our current struggles that we have in the world today. Your take on that? That's yeah. That's a great way to think about it. Um, I'm actually rereading the notes of uh, Saint Therese, and she prayed to uh, her. Her she had lost several siblings before she was born. She was, of course, the last one of her parents, and she had prayed to those uh, lost siblings. And I don't know that all of them were baptized. I guess if they were baptized, they'd, they'd be in heaven. And she prayed to them to overcome her scruples, and that helped. Um, and I believe there actually is an unborn, uh, a preborn baby who is part of a family who's up for canonization. So it's an interesting cause. I actually didn't know about that. But but of course, the Feast of the, uh, the Holy Innocents does in some way affirm the idea that they are in heaven if they can intercede for us. Um, so that's a beautiful cause. I actually didn't know about that, but uh, I'd be happy to see how that turns out. Indeed. And that is practice. A lot of people who have miscarried babies, they're unable to, you know, I've, we've had three ourselves. And the intent is there in a huge way. All we want to do with our children is, is give them to our Lord. It was our greatest desire to to have our babies baptize them. And even should they all have died, um, you know, the eight living children we have, it would have been our greatest joy to baptize them and give them to the Lord. So, you know, that desire is there in spades in terms of the parents wanting to, you know, baptize their children. And when they die in utero uh, early or, or unable to baptize anyway, um, 
you know, there's a lot of hope. And a lot of these parents, uh, us included, give names to their unborn children who they lose in utero and uh, encourage their children, living children, to use their intercession. And uh, I think that's a beautiful practice. I know it's a, it's a gray area, but uh, surely our Lord looks after these little ones whom he has called to himself because, um, you know, in, in the cases of miscarriage, that's not, you know, anyone's uh, doing but the Lord's. The Lord's seen fit to that. Praise be the Lord. And uh, while it's a cross, I think that cross is alleviated and the um, reality mitigated by the intercession of your little ones. Hey, my friends, are you still looking for a Christmas gift for that someone special on your list who seems to have everything? Well, if I got something for you, we've got these beautiful silver rounds. They're one ounce of pure silver. And on it is, of course, a picture of LifeSight commemorating our 25th anniversary, but also the anniversary of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Perfect little gift for that person on your list who has everything. God bless you. God has stepped into our world and said something. Only God could do what we saw. No human being that I'm aware of can replicate that event. We were there with the cameras rolling, um, probably the best of Australian 60 minutes cameraman and sound man in the room. I'd instructed the cameraman to click his camera to real time, not tape time, so that we could analyse afterwards exactly what happened in what time over the period because you camera wouldn't have been rolling for three hours uh, constantly at the big breaks but we want to be able to look at the progression there were others in the room and um the um the stigmata began about around about 12 noon little tiny dots appeared first you know, around the forehead regions as if they were punctured with some thorns then a punch mark appears on the face and then from the fingers the hands small red dots the and then they progressively grew in size as the time went on, and in sympathy with each other, and on the feet, top and bottom. And if you look at the, the footage that I presented in my book and on the documentary, you will see that these wounds are just not surface wounds, they're deep. They, are, they, they look as if a bolt has been driven through those hands. And during the course of her, and she demonstrated or exhibited the signs of what those, those pains were doing to her and almost to the point of death. It was a, 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 an amazing experience for everyone to see. Then the wounds began to heal. And by the next morning, the, the wounds had completely healed beyond what science could ever explain or medical opinion could say. They were completely gone. Normally it would take six weeks to a month for, you know, if you cut yourself and it's quite deep, it doesn't disappear by the next morning. So all of these things that occurred in that experience and um it had quite an effect as it was shown to about 30 odd million 29 million people throughout the united states but the interesting thing is at the end of that stigmata jesus gave her a message and said i've permitted this to happen so that you may show the world what i suffered in my passion and when you wind back and think about what, what has happened god has stepped into our world and said something only god could do what we saw, no human being that I'm aware of can replicate that event to say, um, I, someone could say, I'm, I'm going to have this stigmata in two months' time. Uh, you can fill me now and fill me then, have it there ready to go, and then have the wounds of the crucifixion appear in the exact locations that of Christ's crucifixion with the degree, the depth, the impact that each of those wounds had, and for them to disappear. So, God was working, and we know that God is not beyond stepping into our world to tell us something from time to time. But the interesting thing about what's happened, the, the person who was crucified 2,000 years and died is talking to someone today and saying, I'm going to let you experience, and who rose from the dead, according to our beliefs, is appearing to someone today and telling them, I'm going to allow you to experience what I experience, and I want to show the world what I've done, what's happened, so that you will believe in me. A very powerful experience. Now, my friend, the journalist, he was placed almost in that position as Thomas was when Jesus appeared to his apostles in that room after the resurrection. 
Thomas didn't believe. So the following week he calls Thomas in. Okay, Thomas, have a look here. He touches those wounds and proclaims, my Lord and my God. He knew that he'd been killed on the Friday. He knew that he was there alive. He could see the evidence of what they did to him, and he was able to touch them. The world was given the opportunity to be in that same room with Thomas in that experience. And my friend Mike Willis, he also, because after that, he also proclaimed, my Lord and my God. It changed his life. You know how they say, from the fruit you shall know them? This story, this story of the passion of Christ exhibited in the stigmata like that, um, is, is one of those events. We, we've seen stories of the stigmata back in St. Francis's time, Padre Pio's time, but never been able to carry forward that experience to the real world today with the ammunition that we have today to be able to present to the world through television, this story. It was a major story. Um, it goes to the credibility of this person in, in many ways, and it's only just one mosaic in the full picture of this person. So it was a very important story for us and for my journalist friend. Now, this journalist who decided that God wasn't real in his life, after that event, joined me for 20 years working on stories that of presenting my book and the documentaries. Um, he became an active assistant in trying to tell the reality of these stories that God is intervening in our world today and for a reason. But it's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a great, powerful story, a first in human history, to my knowledge. If someone else can present a similar thing, I'd be keen to know about it and to follow it up. Mm -hmm.